Um, I am Avery Ellen Markham. I'm the executive director of Topeka Doula Project. Topeka Doula Project is a 501c3. Um, we give free doula services out to the community. Um, I am a mom. Um, I am a wife. I am a sister. I'm a daughter. All of those things. Um, I am a graduate of Holland Park High School. I always um, remember to put that in there because I feel like that is important. Um, I am a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Uh, <laughs> and um, I think that's it. That's it. Um, I enjoy coming to these. I thought this was an amazing thing when um, Donna put it on Facebook. I was like, no, yes. I, I definitely need to learn something. Um, so, yeah. All right, we're going to get started. Um, so, my person is Queen Nanny of the Maroons. Um, so um, so I'm going to first start telling you guys about um, the Jamaican Maroons. Um, so the Jamaican Maroons were, some stories say that they were enslaved, um, people who um, got their own freedom. Other people say that they basically jumped off the boat and into the mountains, um, that they were never enslaved people at all, and that they built their own community in the mountains. Um, and they inhabit the Blue Mountains, which still exists in Jamaica today. Um, oh, um, the name Maroon also comes from two different, I guess it would be derivatives or types of sayings. Um, one from Spanish, which is Cimarron, and another in French, which would be um, Negra Maroon, which means enslaved or the mountains. And so that's how we got the name Maroons. Um, next. Okay, so Queen Nanny. Um, she was an amazing woman. She was a freedom fighter. Um, she was a community oriented. She was a leader, um, and that's just to say the least. Um, however, there is little there is little known with certainty of her life. Um, it was kind of up in the air if she was born in Jamaica or if she was captured in what is now Ghana, um, a part of the Ashanti tribe. There was lots of different. Um, there was lots of different evidence of where she had come from, but no, nothing was certain. Um, there was many stories on how she arrived to Jamaica. Some stories say that she was, oh, all of that I already said. Um, there were a lot of conflicting stories just to say the same. Some people said that she was royalty in Africa when she was um, enslaved and then brought over here. Some people say that she was royalty with her father and they traveled to Jamaica and then were captured while they were in Jamaica. So lots of different stories. Um, the Windward Maroons is the Maroons that were led by Nanny. Um, they, they were amazing in guerrilla warfare. Guerrilla warfare is basically like the, um, the, the time to, it's like the, the thing to, what is it called? Camouflage. They were basically excellent at camouflage because they lived in the woods. Um, they used guerrilla warfare amongst the British. So the Spanish had Jamaica and then the British took Jamaica from the Spanish and while the Maroons were there, um, they pretty much were fighting the British the whole time. Um, Queen Nanny of the Maroons also built a new community in the mountains called Nanny Town, which is now modern day Moore Town. Um, it still remains there in the mountains today. Um, both legends and documents refer to her as having ex exceptional leadership qualities. She was a small, weary woman with piercing eyes. Her influence over the, Maroon, over the Maroons was strong was so strong that it seemed to be supernatural and was said to be connected to her powers of Ove. She was particularly skilled at organizing guerrilla warfare that she had learned um, back in Africa. And so this is when the story gets kind of jumbled up on how she got here um, or why she became the leader of the Maroons. Um, the town that was developed um, sustained agriculture and a system of trade with nearby settlements drawing on the social models of West Africa. Um, facing, violent, facing the violence of Britain colonism, Nanny's troops created an initiative, um, innovative new military tactics as they waged increasingly success in their guerrilla warfare. Um, as time kind of went on, um, British was like, I've had enough of this. Um, they keep scaring us, they keep taking our things, they keep killing us. Um, so they decided to do a treaty with the other Maroon um, towns that were in the mountains. Um, but of course, um, Nana refused to sign this treaty. However, the um, majority of the Maroons did sign the treaty and eventually um, she and her people did accept 500 acres of land um, by the 
current governor at that time. The land was surveyed um, and also um, the land was surveyed and they were given, like I said, they were all given 500 pieces of land. Um, her thing about not wanting to sign the treaty, she felt like that was, let's say a slap in the face for lack of better words. Um, she said, they're still doing what they're doing. We are still um, enslaved, even though that we are free. There's too many people still enslaved, was kind of her motto. Um, and Um, so she was widely known as um, a witch, and so this is what Obey is. Obey is um, basically passed down stories and almost things such as witchcraft, which was the supernatural <coughs> abilities that they thought they had. Um, there was a lot of stories, or um, people would call folklore or myths, that said she found some pumpkin seeds in her pocket and was able to feed her whole village for two weeks. Um, they said that the, Brit um, the British... Um, the British army men would say they would look down in holes and it would look like the holes were eating them alive due to this Obey thing. Um, Obey, the magic and witchcraft known as Obey. Obey is a mix of religions from Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados and Belize. It is similar to voodoo and hoodoo from Haiti, um, which is referred to as good and bad magic. Um, so there was something supernatural about her. Um, in Jamaica, um, Nanny of the Maroons is celebrating. Oh, next slide. Yeah. Okay. Um, in Jamaica, um, Nanny of the Maroons is celebrated as a national hero. Her legacy is commemorated through various events, um, monuments, cultural festivals. The annual Nanny of the Maroons Festival, held in Portland, pays homage to her life and achievements, showcasing Jamaican art, music, dance, and cuisine. Um, additionally, her indomitable spirit and unwavering commitment to freedom have influenced artists' expression including literature, music, and visual arts, all in which continue to honor um, her memory today. Um, um, she, okay, yes, um, so again, there's just plenty of, her legacy lives on in the form of poems, song, port portraits, and currency. Um, Annie, um, Nanny's leadership and vision continue to guide us, reminding us the importance of community, unity and the per preservation of our cultural heritage. Um, there was also a lot of talk of her using what she learned in Africa to be able to survive living in the mountains um, and how they were able to sustain themselves and how they are still there today. Um, there are descendants of the, um, of the Maroons that she was in charge of that still live on today and the tr traditions still live on today. Um, so yeah, that is all. Questions or thoughts? Yeah, no children. It was there was a lot, a lot of information about her family. She was said to have been kidnapped with uh, or enslaved with three brothers, but it was not sure if those brothers were real or if those brothers were actually slaves. If she was royalty over in Africa, like there was a lot of back and forth on who was actually related to her. Like her father was supposed to be some type of priest. Um, to where she got kind of her courageous spirit to be a leader. Um, there wasn't many women leaders in the Maroons, um, but she was one that stood out, and I guess a lot of them took on the name Nanny, but specifically her as in Queen Nanny is what they call her in Jamaica. Do we know how she passed? No, well, yeah, that's the same thing as her birth, honestly. So either another Maroon um, people murdered her, or um, she died of old age. That's the way I said. <laughs> she, was either, she was either murdered or literally like 20 years after her murder, possible election. Um, she died of old age. So it kept on, it was conflicting stories again on how she, how she was. Do we know if her father was fine her as well? Um, no. There was literally just, there was one article that I read that only mentioned the father and the brothers. And then um, no other stories mentioned her family. At all. So was it a mixture of like men and women fighting? Yes. Um, from my understanding, yes. Basically, she would help like um, enslaved people get free and get to the mountains, and that's where she would train them in her guerrilla warfare and all of the things and attack the British. You might have said this, and I missed it. But was she married? Did she have kids? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
no, there was nothing on the marriage or kids, just basically her leadership and um, what she did to um, help the Maroons become free. So now they are, um, yeah, they're just, they're just known as, basically they were just the wild slaves in the woods. Um, I'm not sure. Hold on. I'm not sure if there is a national holiday, but I do know that she is um, that she is honored as um, a world leader there. Not a world leader, but um, a world hero um, in Jamaica. Like she has that recognition. So I'm not sure if there's actual. Well, actually, there is a festival, but I don't know if there's a specific day. There wasn't no like I went to Jamaica's like information too. It was like there wasn't any like days of when this festival happens. Through your research. Um, her doing kind of the opposite, like to be able to one be a woman and then lead a whole community of people to literally like sla like slaughter our in the in like the people who are trying to like <laughs> kill them or um, enslave them. That was um, and I'm thinking this is early um, 1800s or 1700s or late 1700s. I can't remember the times, but um, that is huge. And also there was a lot of men mentioned who were in charge of maroon, let's say, camps or sites. Um, but she was one of the only women, and the women who came after her, though, she kind of opened the door to, to allow them to be able to lead. So that's kind of what I took, like. So what can we take from her story as today? Yeah, um, don't be afraid to bring people into your community, because that's what she did. She went and got people and said, come on, and I'm going to teach you something to be better. And that's exactly what she did. They were able to sustain. And the fact that it still stands today um, can, is a testament to her bravery and to what she had to do to kind of put her foot on this world, to say, hey, we are here, and we will not back down, and we will continue to fight for what we believe in. And so that is what you should take away, is don't stop fighting. presentations, but I still learned it down, so I don't forget anything. Um, but, as we look, what do you guys think my shirt means? It all moves. It all goes down to freedom. Uh, or, what are all these names on my shirt? Maybe I should ask that. Different, different, different words. Different words. Different What I'm going to go over, and maybe get a little closer to my mouth, um, what I'm going to go over, I'm not going to assume that you don't know anything about Juneteenth, but I am going to give you some background about Juneteenth, and then hopefully give you a little information for either you dig deeper tonight now, you can ask me questions, or, um, or you can do it later on your own. But I'm also, actually, I didn't forget the women part of it. I, for a moment, I was like, oh, I'm just going to do Juneteenth, give you this little overview of what it is, because Juneteenth is coming up. Um, but then I found my black woman connection, so I'm very happy. In fact, I found two, yo. So um, let me go ahead and get started. And like I said, as, as you said, I mean, it goes by many different names. We call it Emancipation Day, Freedom Day, 
but it is, it is really our country's second Independence Day. Juneteenth is probably one of the most important anniversaries, not just to the black community, but to everybody else, because this was really a pivotal moment in history with a little, with a little qualification. Um, but by the numbers, Juneteenth, more than two years after Abraham Lincoln had issued the Emancipation Proclamation, and he is actually already did by the time this happens, it then took almost five months for Congress passed the 13th Amendment, and then it took another two months for General Robert E. Lee to surrender um, as a Confederate of the Confederate Army, um, and then it's almost 250,000 slaves who were ordered free in Texas on June 19, 1865. So a lot of things happened before that. But according to historian Gregory Downs, African Americans celebrated not just the end of slavery, but the construction and reconstruction of their families, churches, businesses, voluntary associations, and other things they associated with freedom. And then to be fought, they had to defend those gains and people had to fight for them. Next slide. So, um, again, I did this quickly, and I thought a video would be really good. So I think if I did this correctly, you can hit tap on it. Maybe, hopefully. Conspired to keep this a secret from those he enslaved. Hearing this, Brooks stepped out of her hiding spot, proclaimed her freedom, spread the news throughout the plantation, and ran. That night, she returned for her daughter, Tempe. And before Neyland's spiteful bullets could find them, they were gone for good. For more than two centuries, slavery defined what would become the United States. From its past as the 13 British colonies, to its growth as an independent country. Slavery fueled its cotton industry and made it a leading economic power. 10 of the first 12 presidents enslaved people. And when U.S. chattel slavery finally ended, it was a long and uneven process. Enslaved people resisted from the beginning by escaping, breaking tools, staging rebellions, and more. During the American Revolution, Vermont and Massachusetts abolished slavery 
while several states took steps towards gradual abolition. In 1808, federal law banned the import of enslaved African people, but it allowed the slave trade to continue domestically. Approximately 4 million people were enslaved in the U.S. when Abraham Lincoln was elected president in 1860. Lincoln opposed slavery, and though he had no plans to outlaw it, his election caused panic in southern states, which began withdrawing from the Union. They vowed to uphold slavery and formed the Confederacy, triggering the start of the American Civil War. A year into the conflict, Lincoln abolished slavery in Washington, D.C., legally freeing more than 3,000 people. And five months later, he announced the Emancipation Proclamation. It promised freedom to the 3.5 million people enslaved in Confederate states. But it would only be fulfilled if the rebelling states didn't rejoin the Union by January 1st, 1863. And it bore no mention of the roughly 500,000 people in bondage in the border states of Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri that hadn't seceded. When the Confederacy refused to surrender, Union soldiers began announcing emancipation. But many southern areas remained under Confederate control, making it impossible to actually implement abolition throughout the South. The war raged on for two more years, and on January 31st, 1865, Congress passed the 13th Amendment. It promised to end slavery throughout the U.S., except as punishment for a crime. But to go into effect, 27 states would have to ratify it first. Meanwhile, the Civil War virtually ended with the surrender of Confederate General Robert E. Lee on April 9, 1865. But although slavery was technically illegal in all southern states, it still persisted in the last bastions of the Confederacy. There, enslavers like Neely continued to evade abolition until forced. This was also the case when Union General Gordon Granger marched his troops into Galveston, Texas on June 19th and announced that all enslaved people there were officially free and had been for more than two years. Still, at this point, people remained legally enslaved in the border states. It wasn't until more than five months later, on December 6, 1865, that the 13th Amendment was finally ratified. This formally ended chattel slavery in the U.S. Because official emancipation was a staggered process, people in different places commemorated it on different dates. Those in Galveston, Texas, began celebrating Juneteenth, a combination of June and 19th, on the very first anniversary of General Granger's announcement. Over time, smaller Juneteenth gatherings gave way to large parades, and the tradition eventually became the most widespread of emancipation celebrations. But while chattel slavery had officially ended, racial inequality, oppression, and terror had not. Celebrating emancipation was itself an act of continued resistance, and it wasn't until 2021 that Juneteenth became a federal holiday. Today, Juneteenth holds profound significance as a celebration of the demise of slavery, the righteous pursuit of true freedom for all, and a continued pledge to remember the past and dream the future. People resisted slavery in the U.S. as long as it persisted. Uncover the story of those who escaped slavery and created okay. society. Again, the there's just some things that I kind of want to go over a little bit deeper. Um, first being with General Order Number Three, and I think they actually mentioned this inside of it. But most people maybe have heard of this, and this is what General Granger was posted around town. He didn't actually, I think the urban myth is, is that he stood someplace, and I've even said this myself, that he stood someplace and there was a crowd of slaves all standing before him and he spoke it and, and it was so. Um, that's not true. Okay, so I'm here to dispel some myths tonight, basically. It was actually posted around town um, and this is what it said, um, and it came from the headquarters of District of Texas, Galveston, Texas, June 19, 1865, General Orders Number 3. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the Executive of the United States, all slaves are free. 
This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. And the connection hereto for existing between them becomes that of an employer and hired labor. The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and that they will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere. And this is by order of Major, Major General Granger, F.W. Emory, Major A.A. Now this text was actually circulated and reprinted in contemporary newspapers at the time. Um, and one of the earliest ones was in Galveston, the Tri-Weekly News, which printed it on June 20th. One of the in more interesting ones is when it ran in the New York Times and all it simply said was, there is a series of recent general orders. One was issued by Granger, which described Interesting news from Texas. Under the headline, the slaves are all free. And that was it. Now, what has always been interesting to me when I finally read this, um, because we just, again, kind of talked about it. I, when we, I finally read it, it was like, they were telling them to stay put. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that that, yeah, that was a very interesting word to use quietly. We don't want that. We don't. We don't want to hear nothing from y'all. Do you just go continue your relationship with your slave master? We're going to call it something different, but basically, it's the same thing. And you're just going to kind of hope that they pay you. I don't have my glasses on. I just realized who you were. Thank you. Yes. Um, next slide, please. So some of the common mis misconceptions um, about the Emancipation Proclamation that freed, supposedly freed all the slaves, or General Order Number 3, um, that, and that actually marked the end of slavery. In fact, it was the 13th Amendment, which they mentioned in the video, that ratified and proclaimed um, the end of slavery on December 6, 1875 was the article that made slavery illegal in the United States and nationwide, not the Emancipation Proclamation like we all have been kind of taught, that it's actually this 13th Amendment, which is part of the Reconstruction Amendments. Um, but again, I want, to read as, I want to read the 13th Amendment text to you, and it's very simple. Um, section one, neither slavery or involuntary servitude except as punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any other place subject to their jurisdiction. Does that sound like anything familiar to y'all? <laughs> what? Prison pipeline. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's in writing that we can still imprison you and make you a slave to some degree. So these, these are things that structurally we have been kind of taught to overlook. You know, you guys got freedom, right? But there is a loophole in this, and I want you to make sure you notice it. Um, section two, and that the Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. So they made sure there was a legal, a, a legal way for them to control this now. But it still was ratified, and it took three-fourths of the states, 27 of the 36 at the time, um, and it was done by Secretary of State Seward on December 18, 1865, that actually certified <coughs> that the 13th Amendment had become a valid to all its intents and purposes. I'm not going over the drama it took to get it ratified at each state that it existed at that time. On that one, you're just going to have to trust me. But, um, but, you know, the ex but there were actually a couple of ex-Confederate states that did give their assent, which, and of course they also had strings attached to it, but uh, Secretary Seward just basically ignored them. Um, 
Another common misconception is that it took two years for the news of the Emancipation Proclamation to reach Texas. What does that mean? That means that so these it, the enslaved were toiling in the field with actually no knowledge that they were free is what they expect us to believe, right? I mean, any just kind of like at the beginning of the video where the girl was listening in on a conversation, more than likely when that news first hit those southern states, those people knew that they were actually freed. Um, so they knew long before 1865. So what I'm gonna talk about is the white savior mentality here. Um, the switching of the perspective of this event, meaning the only way they knew and had any knowledge of it is when General Granger came and proclaimed to the sea of 250,000 black people that they were free at that point in time. Most of them probably knew it, but then why didn't they do anything about it is what we wanna know. They needed someone to enforce it. So General Granger actually, his presence was about was valuable in during that time period because he was bringing the Union Army in with him, and then there was military backing behind their freedom. So that would hopefully make things better for a little while. Next slide. Um, yes. So I have heard a story like someone, like a messenger. No, uh, oh, you have to think about how tech communication you know, and technology. Yeah, because yeah. it took months for them to find out that we could have been. Uh huh. So, I mean, the traveling news it takes a while, but even still, I don't, I don't think it took that long. I, again, I wasn't there. Yeah. Um, but I, I have a feeling it hit the newspapers, which were widely circulated. You, you had white people in their homes talking about, oh my God, <laughs> we have now lost our labor force. We didn't have the ability to read or write because as slaves, you know, some of us don't have the ability to read or write. Don't be monolithic on me. Oh, okay. no, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying in general. Okay. Okay. okay, yes, yes. So, I looked at the barriers. Uh huh. There are some, and there would have been some barriers, and then they would have been relying on overhearing things. Or someone else saying something. Did you? Have you run across anything about how many enslaved people were murdered on that transition? No, I have not. But I've not looked for it either, so. Um, that happens a lot, though. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, what do you mean? No, you're okay. Oh, okay. I was like, yeah, the tech person got up and walked away. <laughs> um, let's see after emancipation decisions. Now on about April 1865, blacks were free to move around the country because that is the end of, that is the, April 1865 is the end of, yes ma'am, um, they could, but, but they actually didn't initially. Um, initially, ex-slaves were more concerned about finding their family members, um, getting an education, and settling down in, in their new lives. Um, some emancipated slaves quickly fled from their owners, um, but others actually did stay and become wage laborers for their former owners. But most importantly, African Americans could make choices about themselves and about where they labored and the type of work that they performed. So, um, but during Reconstruction, which is immediately after the Civil War, the South wasn't necessarily the best place to live, don't get me wrong but it was tolerable in some areas. In fact, coming out west was not necessarily the big opportunity in the 18, 1865 to the 1870s. There were social, political, and economic conditions in some cases that mirrored what was going on in the south. So meaning coming up north and going out west was just as bad as staying in the south. If you live in Kansas, you might be able to relate to that a little bit. Um, but once, the three Reconstruction Amendments, which are the 13th, which abolished slavery, the 14th, which made sure there was due process, and the 15th, which is voting, had passed the West would drastically change and become a place where freedom was worth pursuing out here. Um, and then conversely, in the South, by 1877, and Reconstruction ending, the conditions were getting worse. But after that, um, 
once the reconstruction amendments pass, you know, that's when we joy where we had this kind of hate. I don't I don't want to use the word hated. I don't want to say it was a great life. It was a better life, meaning that we could vote, we could participate in the political process, we could acquire land, um, we could seek employment, um, we could use public accommodations. You know, opponents of this progress, however, soon rallied the former slaves and began a means of eroding those gains. Now, I did have to take that little detour. Um, but, next slide. Because I want you to be aware of the conditions that things were going okay for a while. Um, and people immediately after, even the first year after um, the end of the Civil War, those 250 enslaved people in Texas started celebrating that next year. Um, and even if they had left the area, they would go back to Texas and celebrate that. Um, and soon that tradition of either Juneteenth, Freedom Day, Emancipation Day, Liberation Day, Jubilee Day, or June, Juneteenth um, would be celebrated across the United States. So what happened, right? Um, well, basically, as we see an increase, and this is really considered an act of resistance when you think about it, they were out in the streets celebrating freedom and they have white people looking on at them saying, this ain't gonna work, y'all. <laughs> this is not going to work. So what happened? We started getting Jim Crow laws. We started getting black codes. We started having our bodies policed in public spaces. I mean, and so some of them even countered and got money together, I think in Galveston, in Texas specifically. What they did is they bought land so they could have their own park and celebrate in their own way that they wanted to do. Um, so that's just some of the various different ways that Juneteenth started being celebrated was, you know, people, guys from the Civil War, they would do reenactments. Um, I've not seen a black reenactor in like it ever. But it's cool that they did it back then. Um, you know, it was a chance to buy new clothes, have a parade. Um, they would hear political speeches. You could see some of this stuff in the newspaper. And this continued on for many years. Um, but eventually, because of the over-policing, um, eventually it started fading out. You, you would see rises and falls of it. And I'm getting ready to hand the mic back to Bree in just one second. Next slide. So let's rapidly go to present day. Has anyone heard of Opal Lee before? Yes. Yeah, -hoo. yeah she actually visited. Huh? <laughs> she actually visited Topeka, I want to say three or four years ago. Three years ago, thank you, because I, I had COVID. Uh, there's a whole block of time. I don't know what happened. Um, she is considered the grandmother of Juneteenth, so this is the one of the black women you should know about. Um, she has been the driving force to make it a federal holiday. Um, she is currently 97 years old, living in Texas. Um, but when, in 2016, when she was 89 years old, she began to walk from her home in Fort Worth to Washington, D.C. It was a symbolic walk. Um, it would, the trek would be two and a half miles each morning and afternoon as a representation of the two and a half years black Texans did not know um, had not received that official word yet. So, but instead of me telling you, well, and to summarize, um, as, especially because of the pandemic, the heightened awareness of racial equality and Lee putting on more pressure, she got over 1.5 million signatures, if I understand that number correctly. And Joe Biden in 2021, designated June 19th as a federal holiday. The next slide. Well, maybe it'll work. I don't know. It doesn't look like it has a big arrow on it. Which, which, um, where's there two presentations in that one? I think I copied the wrong one. So, as she, she, did you just, did y'all hear me just heavy sigh? Like, 
I'm processing this. Because um, this is really a good video and we might have to come back and revisit it um, if I can log in someplace else and get my other set of flies. This is her explaining her life, her background, and um, the fact that her family's house in the 1930s was burned down on June 19th as well, and how this became a crusade. And she explains what, oh, you found it. Look at you, girl. I'm impressed, great. And I'll give you the microphone. Believe that when you get a certain age, you're going to get in your rocking chair and wait for the Lord to call you. Well, he's going to have to catch me because there's too much more to do. My name is Opal Lee, and my grandchildren, my great grandchildren, neighbors, and friends say, Grandy Opal Lee. I'm born in Marshall, Texas, you know, and we moved to the south side of Fort Worth. But on the 19th day of June, 1939, people began to farm on a sidewalk. The papers said it was 500 of those people. Those people tore that place apart. They burned the furniture. Nobody was charged with that. Nothing happened. I taught third grade for so long. You got books that will show people in the cotton fields smiling. They love to pick cotton. We were able to tell the children that's not true. I pick cotton. I know it's not true. We had a Juneteenth in a tiny little Sycamore Park. 30,000 people came, the papers said. And I'm not sure we knew what we were celebrating about. We found out actually what happened when General Gordon Granger made his way to Galveston. What he did was to nail this General Order Number 3 to the door of what's now Reedy Chapel, African Methodist Episcopal Church. The enslaved had known they were free for two and a half years. And I sort of felt like we weren't remembering. The ultimate goal was for Juneteenth to become a national holiday. Surely, if a little old lady in tennis shoes is walking, you know, from here to Washington, somebody would take notice, and I would tell them. I was walking two and a half miles to symbolize that the enslaved had known they were free for two and a half years. I was invited all over these United States. I had the opportunity to go to the White House and meet so many extraordinary people who are on the same page I'm on. Now we have to turn our attention to the disparities in the country, and I'm talking about joblessness, homelessness, and schools that don't have textbooks that tell the truth, <sighs> health care, police brutality, climate change. As a nation, we have to take the responsibility of making our country the very best country there is, because we are a nation who can get things done, and we need to be the leader.
that's really, as we know, last year, uh, Joe Biden did heed their request. And, oh no, it wasn't last year. I'm thinking of Kelly. Never mind. Anyway, 2021. 2021. Thank you. Um, that uh, it did become a national holiday. Um, but many states still did not, were not on board yet. It will be in a minute. <laughs> but so, um, then what to do? Then at the local level, what do you do? You have people who are involved in Juneteenth. Miss Norma Avery, I met her um, when I did an exhibit on black people in Topeka. And she has been an advocate and organizer of Juneteenth. Um, for many years, I went to their website. They do have a national, um, not a national, they do have a local website. Topeka Family and Friends Juneteenth Celebration um, is coordinated by the Topeka Family and Friends Juneteenth, excuse me, is coordinated. I'm trying to see what you are doing. Are you finding it? I'm trying, but I don't know. Topeka Shawnee County Public Library, Juneteenth. Thank you. Um, and we just, we're just gonna hear just briefly why Norma got involved with it. But again, the very specific objectives that her group has set out is to provide the community the opportunity to learn what Juneteenth means and to learn about how it all began, to bring the community together, to focus on local community needs, to provide opportunities to engage in recreational and teaching activities, to learn about African-American history and culture, um, I was hoping someone from the organization might be here tonight, and uh, I think you need to go to the actual website of the library. Um, and like I said, during COVID, Norma gave a few words as to what Juneteenth meant to her and why it's important. But um, those are the two women that I associated with um, Juneteenth. Hi, we can tell I'm stalling, can't we? Mm -hmm. Just a second. No, I think you actually have to type in Juneteenth. I did, but just Juneteenth? On the website, not on the catalog page. If you go back home, and then if you click oh, search the library website okay. in Juneteenth. And I might just give y'all some homework <laughs> <laughs> to follow that process to do that. So. Oh. For the one that years back? Um, sure, he did that project, but yep. Um, I think uh, it's on you passed it. It was on YouTube. Yeah, it's connected into YouTube, so but I don't, I didn't. See, well, I don't have my glasses on y'all, so I'm really not a reliable source right now. <laughs> but um, it's a peak on library. There she is. Yeah. Yeah. Speeches. Uh, the, the kids have games and 
We just enjoy that day because it is the day of freedom for us. Uh, we just sit back and think about what our past, our forefathers have done for us. And we're just very thankful. All thanks to Juneteenth. Hey, I think that was my last slide. Yeah? Yeah, thank you. There you go. That's me. In case you still haven't figured out who I am yet. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, that is, that's all I have for Juneteenth there. I did bring in honor of Juneteenth. So there is some sweet tea, some strawberry lemonade, and some watermelon over there because red is the symbolic color of Juneteenth. So thank you for listening, and I will stand for questions. I, I know you do. <laughs> and I, that's why I appreciate you. Oh, I do have a flyer. Yes. Okay, so when we were talking, about Juneteenth and how, you know, they free the slaves and stuff like that. Um, we talked about the Jim Crow laws and we touched on that a little bit, about Jim Crow laws and some of the things that happened because a lot of people were scared that a lot of slaves were going to revolt. And <clears throat> I was thinking back here, you know, I'll be thinking you know. uh, about how at that time, that's when mass lynching started happening. Um, that was after the, free, the slaves were freed, that was a, after a lot of slave owners were scared that slaves were going to revolt, you know. Ex-enslaved, ex yes. Ex-enslaved. Um, and, and it made me think about how could I relate this to now? You know, what's going on now in the world? You know, how can I apply this? How can we continue to grow forward? How can we let love? And then I just quickly researched, you was talking on my phone that when... President Trump was the president that they said that there was an increase about a 25% hike in violent crimes and hate crimes. Specifically, they said it was like 60% when I was looking at the Washington Post that said um, about 60% were based solely on race. During that time, I love my community, I love everybody, and I, I was, my son was playing soccer. And one of the soccer player dads and mom that I sat by all the time was sitting next to me, and he was like, Tamika, um, I feel comfortable telling you this because you're my friend. And I was like, what's up? And he was like, you know, when we feel like our power is being threatened, we're going to take our power back. Oh, I said, man. huh? Well, he's your friend. Uh, he's not <laughs> friend. Well, uh, but, okay. And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, you know, I'm just saying. And I was like, what do you mean just saying? Uh Anyway, you know, you know, and going back to that, um, I just wanted to correlate and talk about how, like they said in that same article, that since Biden is been president, there has been a decrease in um, hate crimes. Mm -hmm. And all I want to say is that uh, the remnants of slavery. Juneteenth, um, social injustices, um, is still well alive today. Oh, and I just want to say, I just want to give that reminder. I mean, I guess I'm speaking to the choir, but look at how ways, just like we saw Opal, you know, Lee talk about how, you know, we're a nation, we should be a leader. What are we doing, you know, as individuals in Topeka, you know, to make a difference about what we see in the injustices? Or are we just sitting by waiting for the next person to do it? You know what I'm saying? And I know we come to events like this and everything like that, but the research, I mean, the research is there. And history repeats itself. And the thing is, when we don't know our history, that's when we, it continues to repeat itself. And that's why I like coming to events like this, because we can learn and broaden our knowledge. But again, I just, real quick, I'm going to research it even more, uh -huh. but I'm, I'm going to sit down. Okay, I was going to say, is it my turn? It's your time. Okay. <laughs> oh, so, I mean, really, in a way, you're kind of asked to summarize the two conversations tonight. Um, and I think I can. 
we this is put down on the spot at the end of every meeting if I can summarize and pull everything together um, so we can continue the conversation. What I found interesting about Nanny was, as you said, she was a leader and she didn't let anything stop her. I mean, we don't know that much about her life, but whatever she did, she learned the skills and then she put her skills into play, right? And so as a community, we do have to figure out what our personal skills are and then put them into play for the rest of the community. So then we look at Opal, what was she good at? You know, she was a teacher before she became an activist. So part of her activism was just going around and teaching everybody that she could about uh, Juneteenth and then putting that forward, then developing a plan, right? To, to move that forward. So she had a goal in mind. So to answer your question, how are we putting our individual skills to play at play to create a community with a goal in mind? What is our community goal? For me, for this, was just education and to bring people together. I had a conversation earlier today with a friend of mine, and she is in a white group like this one. Right? Um, very similar to this. And her, the thing she said that we must be getting out of this is that sense of community, is that safe space, that safe place that I have the skills to create. So when you think of yourself, what are the skills that are, are you putting into play to advance the community for? You can answer me out loud or you can just say it to yourself. But I love brave people. <laughs> Bodily autonomy. Huh? So mind is bodily autonomy. Mind is bodily autonomy. Um, bodily autonomy, not just for the birthing person, but bodily autonomy for the family. Um, because I do family work, because I tell them, bring everybody to the kitchen table. Um, I am not supposed to be talking to people about um, high blood pressure and diabetes, but I do. Because people come to the table with those problems. So let's talk about how you can get care. Um, but bodily autonomy, knowing what is happening just with our bodies, um, that in itself is a form of activism in my eyes. Um, giving people the courage to say, oh wait, I know something, so then now I can do something. And actually somebody brought up the use of those two words, activism and advocacy. Is there a difference between the two or how do we employ them because you use very specifically the word activism when it comes to your body. What is the difference between activism and advocacy in y'all's minds? You, you have to use the mic. Hey, um, I kind of hate talking at events, but uh, <laughs> I'm compelled to answer this question because we talk about it a lot with the work that I do. But the key part of, yeah, well, oh, well, 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 they, um, they, they, they did really get me. My name is Anita Alexander. I'm the vice president of a nonprofit organization called Wild Light, and we focus on voting rights and um, championing voting rights for minorities and for disenfranchised folks. And the difference between um, advocacy and activism is the act part of the word. And we can advocate for stuff and say we believe in stuff and maybe even post a thing to raise awareness, but that's different from activism, where you are taking an action towards your cause. And so I think that's, yeah, I'll just say that. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, does anyone else have any thought of how, what skills they have and how they are employing them? Or maybe you want ideas of what skills you have and how you can employ that for the benefit of the community. I'll share, but I don't okay. know that I need, I'm not going to stand up and make sure we get it. Okay, no, I'm bringing you the mic. Okay. So, my name is Felicia Glass, and I'm a mental health provider I'm here at Topeka. So, I introduce myself to people as a conduit of healing. And so, my primary responsibility to my community is to help my community heal. And that healing can be from personal issues, but life issues as well. So, I deal with people's trauma from birth till death. And so I believe that we cannot activate and or 
or to take action or advocate for others until we first learn to advocate for ourselves. And so if I can teach people and embrace, get people to embrace that there is still healing that needs to take place within their body, then they can begin to heal their communities. Is it okay with y'all if, thank you, Felicia. Is it okay with y'all if, like I said, life be life in and you are not active or an advocate or sometimes just the very act of showing up? Is that okay? Because yes. I need y'all all to be able on the same page. That's Because sometimes we see people and then we don't see them. And we don't know why. Um, for me, I'm probably on a road trip. Okay, but that is my sense of joy, my sense of peace, being able to go out. But when I come back, I have a sense of renewed optimism, refreshed, not always relaxed, but, but I've also probably learned something along the way um, that I can come back and share with everybody else here. So um, yeah, does anyone else have any thoughts on this? If, I, if that's okay, um, I'm Carice. Yes. I own 785 Magazine and help doing the live stream. But something that uh, is interesting to me in media world here, um, and I'm asked and I'm friends with, I'll go on the camera, hi, you know, I'm friends with, um, with uh, other newspapers and magazines, et cetera. But one of the things that I've been asked throughout the years is how 785 has diversity in the magazine and how we, um, you know, reach out, and, you know, is there a formula to it, right? Is there, I mean, these are good questions that I ask, and, and I think at the simplest form, um, I always say is that when I have a, you know, everybody's a contributor, if they, they come together, nobody knows everybody, ex except for me, and I know their name, and if we do know everybody, then I'm not doing the job as the editor of a publication that's for a community, because we all have our own are in circles. You know what's happening in your circle, and that knows what's in her circle, you know? And without having different people at the table, how could it be, you know, uh, comprehensive? How could it um, obviously speak to the whole community? And so I think that sometimes just not overthinking and then there's space for everybody, and there's other, I love chairs, there's a lot of chairs, so pull up a chair and come on in. And just that kind of mentality, I think, could open up a lot of things for people. Uh and I 100% agree with you, but sometimes it's about getting on the invitation list. And yeah. um, and how do we make ourselves accessible to be on that invitation mm -hmm. list? Um, I tell people all the time, it depends on where you meet me, what hat I'm wearing, and to get to know me as the chairperson of the planning commission versus Donna, who's going to a Bowie rodeo, is a totally different thing. Um, so while I agree with you, also we do need to make sure we honor our safe spaces. Absolutely. And make sure that we are building our, that was, you know, this, this is um, a statement I'm gonna really make that some people will be like, hell yeah, Donna Ray. And other people are like, oh, she said that out loud. Um, integration. Integration might not have been the best thing for our community. Um, when we were segregated, we had our own safe spaces. You could go up the street and you knew someone was watching your child, irregardless of who your child was. When you were in that classroom, you saw a face that looked just like yours to some degree. Like I was in Bowley, I know that people looked like me, I knew there, I, there was much more of an instant connection. So we also have to make sure groups like this are honored as well. So, um, and then you can go out and exercise and be part of other things. Um, I thought I saw a hand. Yes, Teresa. Oh, yeah. As I hesitantly raised my right hand. <laughs> okay. okay. But I think I also speak loud. But I want to say, um, first of all, society was engineered. Somebody had a dream, somebody came up with a plan, and they put it together, and many of us are living someone else's dream. Edward Bernays, in particular, was a social engineer and social scientist who was hired by multiple countries, including the United States. 
And sometimes we think we're making a decision when we're only giving three, given three choices. Okay? Now, I created a program to eradicate racism and implicit bias. And it's a 12 step program that's patterned after Alcoholics Anonymous. And I can say that publicly because I've gotten permission from the attorneys in New York with that program to model my program after. Now, mine is in the infancy stage, and I would like to invite, I'm going to have to start inviting people because it's going to actually kick off in July this summer. So hopefully it doesn't get too hot. to make sure we shout out somebody 
to make sure we, someone else is invited to the table. All right. Thank you, guys. Time for community announcements. Have you got any? Oh, um, all right. Uh, oh, okay. Go ahead. Right.
Thank you.